Well, I guess we get started. Get past our bedtime. You know, the discussion we had uh, early today about what to do with the museum. I'm kind of on the boat of let's get let's get it to somebody who's going to take care of it because right now it's a labor of love. If they give this stuff to a museum, it'll become an asset. They'll, they'll own it, like uh, Fish and Body Craftsman's Guild's in the same boat. Uh, the youngest guildsman is now 70, and we've been really worried about what happens to the legacy of the Craft Fish and Body Craftsman's Guild when we all die. And we know our cars will be, will be uh, uh, carpet toys for kids. <coughs> and that's probably what's gonna happen to all our models unless we get them somewhere that, where they can be respected. So, uh, <coughs> What the Fish Body Craftsman's Guild is doing, we're going around the museums and we finally got the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles to put on an exhibit. But they required that you, you give them the car, they own it, and you get the tax write off. But most of us aren't going to be here in 20 years, so that's at least you know it's going to be in a place where it's going to be shown for a while. So that, that's just kind of my take on that. Can you explain a little further the connection with the Peterson? Peterson Museum is an auto museum that... Yeah, I, 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 that I know what it is, but I... The Fisher Body Craftsman's Guild, we've been, we've been looking for places that will take our cars and, and put on a permanent exhibit. And I lived in California until 2019 when I moved to Texas, and I would call them once a month trying to get them interested in putting on an exhibit, and they just weren't interested. We've been doing the same thing. Okay. Uh, but uh, Tony Simone, who was a uh, top prize winner in 61, has been hit, uh, spearheading this thing, and he finally got them to accept an exhibit. So you just got to keep working on them. Okay. But, and, and another, I'll, I'll be a little <coughs> more pessimistic about this whole thing. You know, where are the teenagers here? You know, in 15 years, if this is the group that's coming, uh, Mark had no, has no reason to put it on a show because there's not going to be anybody here. And the same way with the Fisher Body Craftsman's Guild, the, oldest, the youngest guildsman, 70, in 10 years, will we'll basically all be gone. The National Street Rod Association, Association, I was a member of the National Street Rod Association, that's cars up to 1948. That's the definition of a street rod. About five years ago, they opened it up to cars to 1984. The old, the old timers are going away, guys. So we, we need to get places to put this stuff because the uh, American graffiti generation is quickly disappearing. So I, I vote for get, getting this museum into, uh, as a profit center for, for somebody who's going to take care of it and, and they realize the value of it. You know, that's my soapbox. Okay, we'll talk about the Mysterion and I'll particularly talk about building the 1-8 scale version of it, but I'll talk a little bit about it in, in general. Talk about Ed Roth. Uh, everybody knows who Ed Roth is. I just want to say a little bit about Ed. Some people don't realize, realize what a unique fellow he was. Uh, that he, most of his photos you ever see, he's, he's handing for the camera. Here he's uh, showing off the use of a, a tape measure and building his uh, beatnik bandit. Ed was not a car customizer, and that's a mistake people make. They say, that's, this is a, not a very practical car, you, you know, why does it have two rear ends, how does it drive? It's not a car, it's a piece of art. He, he, he made art in the, in the motif of, of automobiles. If you just looked at the Detroit Iron that, that Ed Roth modified, we wouldn't know who Ed Roth is. He, he made this uh, shop truck, it's nothing but a paint job. There's really nothing unique on this car at all. And it got made into a Ravel model because it's Ed Roth. And his little jewel is the first hot rod he owned, I think. Uh, pretty run of the mill. You see these with rod runs all the time. Nothing to talk about here. Uh, it's 55 Chevy. It's high school uh, technology. He took off the front bumper, uh, radius the wheel wells, put a cheesy hood scoop on it, some pinstripes. And as I was mentioned to one of the fellows here, uh, Ford gave Ed three Ford FE390 FE, uh, engines. He put two of them in this, he put the other one in that car. Uh, he drove uh, this little Honda, and it was basically just for practicing pinstriping. That, this Honda is actually down in the uh, 
uh, uh, GAS, uh, Galpin Auto Sports Museum in Los Angeles. They, they've got that in their collection. So up to this point, uh, Ed Roth was not a very distinguished car customizer. Uh, and uh, we're all familiar with this. I think a lot of us probably had the kit of the Tweety Pie. Uh, pretty neat little uh, tea bucket. The problem is he didn't build it. Uh, a fellow named uh, Bob Johnson of Anaheim, California built it. Ed bought it from him, pinstriped it, put on a couple of chrome pieces on it, but it, it wasn't his car. But then it happened, Ed found fiberglass. And he, this is the first fiberglass car he built, and it's a piece of art, it's not a car. It, it was very drivable, it was, it was the most practical car he built. But that body looks like a tea bucket, but it's totally hand-formed. There, there's, it wasn't, there's no tea bucket base to the thing. About that time, our godfather, uh, Jim Keeler, uh, was hired at uh, Ravel, and he was a teenager, and so he, taught, he knew what teenagers liked. Uh, up to that point, Ravel was, as I understand the legend, Ravel was making military models, you know, nothing to talk about. Uh, AMT had come out with the three-in-one kits. The three-in-one kits were just promotional models that uh, AMT put a couple of uh, uh, screws, on, screws in with some performance and some show things and still had the screws that screwed the chassis into the, into the body. So they were having some success. So Ravel said, maybe we didn't get in the car business. They hired Jim. That was a stroke of brilliance because Jim knew what kids liked. And I was a kid at this time. That's what I liked. So he debuted with this car, Ravel signed him to a contract, and uh, they built a model of it. It was a big hit. So it was, it was a, uh, a benefit to Ed. He was making all kinds of money on uh, getting one penny a piece for his kits, and he was becoming very, very rich. But it was also a kind of a curse because Ravel said, okay, we want a car a year. So he had to be creative enough to make uh, one of these things every year. His next one in 1961 was uh, the Beatnik Bandit. I, uh, this is his, I think, most popular and probably most famous car he built. It really uh, broke the mold for any kind of car building. It was totally impractical. There's a picture of him sitting in, this, in the seat in this car with the bubble top raised up. The, bu no, bubble, the bubble top is vertical and there's no way he could even get it started down over his head. This is a totally undrivable car, but it doesn't matter. It's just one of the most beautiful cars ever built. Ravel made the kit here. Uh, here's where I entered the picture in 1962. I quit looking at the toys at, at the grocery store and started looking at hot rod magazines. And I opened up to this article right here and it hooked me. Uh, I found out who Ed Roth was. I found out he was making cars strictly out of fiberglass. In this one, this picture, here he is with the uh, Oldsmobile engines in it, in the chassis with the hydromatic transmissions. But he built he built the chassis, he built the, all the wheels, everything was chrome plated, and he hadn't he hadn't even started making the body yet. So it, the guy was an artist. He just he just made art. This was the second installment in the magazine series. Uh, a few months later, and it's showing him making the body. Again, this hooked me too, uh, making plaster body and then putting five fiberglass on it. Uh, very, very, various pictures of this. If you look very closely here, on uh, the, this picture right here, it has a straight chromed tie rod. He ended up putting a, uh, a uh, what do you call it? Huh? Drag link? No, horizontal steering gear. What do you call it? Oh, rack, and rack and pinion. My part time is getting to me. He ended up with a rack and pinion on it, but he started out with with uh, just a straight chrome tie rod. So he was he was build, he was inventing this as he was building it. This is the res the reveal article of the uh, the car. To me, this is the most beautiful magazine cover ever published. And that's my personal opinion, and you should accept it as truth. <laughs> but this started the, the mystery of the Mysterion because instead of having a, a photo shoot inside, they had a cartoon feature. 
and they showed nothing about the car. Actually, until until many, many years later, these were the three best pictures you had of the car in existence anywhere. But again, I'm, that uh, first picture that I showed of Ed with the tape measure, handing it for the cameras, he was serious. He did not use a tape measure. I have a, uh, I have a video that he self-filmed of himself making uh, one of his tricycle uh, V8 uh, motorbikes that he went into after he quit making these cars. And he right in there, he was, he was slopping past around and he said, I don't use a tape measure, it might be off a half inch there, three quarter inch there, it's just the way it is. But look at this, I drew a, I drew a, this is a pretty good picture of, of the Mysterion, I drew a line right down the center, so I split the headers, I split the seat, I split the bubble, so that's pretty much center line of the car. Then I, I traced these black lines, I traced the major uh, body features on the car here, and it flipped them over and put them on this side. This is how far off that one side is from the other. There's four inch, four inch difference between these two fins. That's one of the things that makes it really hard to make a reproduction of the car because it was it was off in so many yeah. weird places that you can't really make. It's hard to make a true reproduction because it's so far off in, in various places. My compromise was I was slave to a tape measure, so I did the tape measure for making the wood form to do my plaster on the big car. But then when I did the plaster, I just did it freehand and sanded it. I didn't do any measurements after that. So anyway. I started out making the big car with the, the nose pod. I didn't know what headlight rim to use, so I was going to use the taillight rim of a uh, Galaxy Galaxy uh, 63 Galaxy, which had the same diameter, make it up. I had some uh, some backup lights from a 54 Buick. I was going to use those, and you know I was going to make it sort of good. I, I was probably going to get a modern, a couple of modern Ford engines, and just make it kind of good. But about that time, I found out. Well, wait a minute. This is a 52 uh, Plymouth headlight. I know what that is. And I found out these were actually Ford, uh, 44 backup lights. I know what that is. So I started finding out what his parts were. And there, there's no magazine articles that tell you what they are. You just kind of have to study the photos and, and go swap meets and figure out what all these things are. But well, maybe I'll start making a, a more accurate uh, version of this car. And that's as far as I, as I got with the, the big car. Uh, and family life was in the way, so I made that thing. and. and quit and I started making the model. So the way scale model is totally scratch built. There's a few, I'll talk about what uh, kit parts I used on it, but uh, there's nothing Mysterion, Mysterion like in kits, one eight scale kits. So you just have to about build everything. I'll talk about how it made all the parts. This is as far as I got, scaling it off the uh, uh, Revell kit, and it, it finally dawned on me, I don't know enough about this car to do the details right. You know, the bubble is, is pretty straightforward, the body was pretty straightforward, the engines are Ford FE, so you get information on those. But you, you start studying it out, and you just don't know enough about the car to finish it. So I did this up through about uh, 2001, that's as far as I got, and I put it away for 17 years. In the meantime, we built the big one, and then I knew enough about it to go back and hit this. The dimensions I got for the model, I just uh, Xeroxed the uh, Revell uh, parts, blew them up to 1 8 scale, and then that's what I used to carve the bucks and make the, the, the frame. The notations you see on here, I took these drawings and scaled them up for the one-to-one -one version, so I built the one-eighth scale body before I built the one-to-one -one body. First step was to carve the sugar pine pattern. That's up here. Uh, uh, it's the same way that uh, if you go to the museum, the body that uh, they that Ravel used for making their plastic model the cardboard body is down there and it looks real similar to what I did here the uh, the nose piece I carved in three pieces 
and I'll talk about the bubble a little later. The next thing I did was uh, make fiberglass molds off of this and I made it a, they made them come apart at the obvious body line so it could be taken apart and uh, reassembled. And I just used a hardware store uh, mat and resin. Uh, all those body parts are clamped together and then the body is laid in there in one piece. So you have a one piece body. The uh, nose pieces were all uh, laid up in separate pieces and then glued together. There's some, there's some errors in this thing I had to fix after I learned more about the car. But got the whole thing together. Now to make the frame rails, the best I could find in scaling this this car was that Ed used some sort of seven inch by two inch channel. And I don't know exactly what he used, but all I could find uh, in the uh, craft stores was three quarter inch, which is six inch, and uh, seven eighths, which is seven, uh, seven inch, or uh, one inch, which is uh, eight inches. And so I used, I, I made them in, I made two sets. I made one in uh, three quarter and one in uh, one inch and three quarter bit better, so these are not quite to scale. I made up these uh, these patterns here, so I, I took some square tubing, put a stick inside the square tubing, ran it through my table saw, so I got the one quarter inch wide rail, <clears throat> and that rail sits down in these grooves here, and then I put on my drill press and I get my holes evenly spaced and square and everything. And I made this jig to uh, make the two cuts for the uh, dog leg and the frame, so they both came out exactly the same. This is the pattern up here for blowing the bubble, um, and I literally blew, blew the bubble. Uh, this frame has the base shape of the bubble, soldered these little two uh, uh, limits here to, keep, to make those little side bubbles that he had put in his uh, top. This piece right here is just a, a limit to keep the bubble, you know, see how high to blow the bubble. Uh, if you do this, be warned that if your bubble comes up here and touches that, it blows the bubble up, so <laughs> stay below it. Anyway, just drill a bunch of holes, sandwich a piece of a uh, 16th inch uh, uh, plexiglass in there, and there's a pipe right in here that, that goes in underneath the, <coughs> underneath the uh, plastic. And I just put silicone in here to keep from leaking air. Put it in the oven, heat it up to 425 degrees or so until you see the, the plastic start to sag, pull out of the oven, put a little rubber hose on there, blow on it, pop it up. I did about five or six of them, it was so much fun. <laughs> okay, for this, this black surround around the windshield here, I took one of my plastic bubbles, right? Hey, oops, keep hitting the wrong buttons. I took one of the plastic bubbles and I, I put the shape on here in, in Bondo about a of the bubble about an eighth of an inch. Then I took a uh, plaster cast of, of that and then I took a Bondo cast of the plaster and then I could use a heat gun to use quarter inch round uh, plastic to, to make this around. Okay, the digit on the back of the, of the Mysterion, I laid it on there in, in Bondo, cast it in uh, uh, silicone rubber Back that up with some plaster. Made a little uh, cap right here so you, I could pour these. I poured one in uh, urethane. I'll talk about the urethane I used to, to cast this with. I didn't really need to do this. I was I did this assuming I was going to start making kits. I'm not going to make kits, so I could make more of them. But I only needed one. Okay. Obviously, use some kit parts, and you'd think big T's were the ones that I used, but I actually used more of the uh, uh, Lindbergh Big Red Rod. They had, these are all the parts I used from the Big Red Rod. They had the carburetors, which aren't quite right, they need to be WW, Stormberg WWs. These are uh, 97s, but you can't tell the difference. But they had the air cleaners with the helmet that had the bump, bump up helmet instead of the concave helmet. That was the proper one to use. I used their distributors, all their pulleys, and the rear end, I'll talk about the rear end a little later. From the big deuce, I used these parts. I used the engine block, the heads, and the 
and the front cover. And the heads are, are similar to a Ford FE with the exhaust ports outside the head, where Chevys have the exhaust ports in the water jacket. So all I had to do is modify this a little bit, uh, cut the bell housing off of these and modify them a little bit. And uh, I, could, I, I use those to cast the engine parts. Here's all the molds I made for the engine parts. That was the easy part, was the, the plastic parts. Uh, the rest of the parts, the transmissions, the valve cover, the oil pan. Let's see, this is, I think this is the intake manifold being cast right now. And the valve cover and the bell housing, I carved all those out of wood and then cast, made uh, silicone rubber castings of those from the silicone rubber molds. I cast the urethane parts. Here's all the parts that I uh, cast from my molds to, to make the two engines. And all, all those molds are up here. You can look at you can handle all these molds. Uh, they're pretty tough. Okay, the silicone rubber I found for making molds. Uh, I tried several products. I tried a couple of <coughs> silicones would last about a week and then they just start crumbling, falling apart. Uh, I tried using uh, urethane rubber Urethane rubber makes really good molds, it's flexible and everything, but you have to be very careful, you have to use, use mold release and still it doesn't want to release because it likes to stick to the, the casting resin. So silicone is the best thing to use because you don't need mold release, just pour the urethane in there, let it harden and pops right out. You see a lot of blue molds up here. It's basically the same as this, as this white stuff, but it takes about 24 minutes to, sell, to uh, set. This white stuff only takes about eight minutes to set. And all model builders love instant gratification, and that gives you instant gratification, so I like this stuff better. But th these molds, some of these are 10, 10 12 years old, and they're, they're still in fine shape. The plastic parts, the hard plastic parts, I uh, use a smooth, smooth cast uh, urethane resin. It's real, has, uh, uh, property is real similar to, to styrene and it, it emolds real quickly too. It's it's like 10 minutes it's set. So you stir it up, pour the cast, it's clear and then it starts turning white. As soon as it's totally white, you pop it out of the mold. So that made making the parts pretty easy. And those are both available on Amazon. Walmart sells it, mail order. <coughs> Made a bunch of different uh, molds for, for casting. Uh, Use the shiny side of cardboard. I've done that before. Here's most of the molds I made for the car. Uh, these are urethane rubber. These are the silicone rubber. This is the good white silicone rubber. For the front wheel, I'll talk about that a little later. Um, and I don't have the bad silicone in there. I'll show you. <coughs> front wheel was uh, made from a big T. Uh, steel wheel to have the have the big front of the of the wheel like that one was up here. And on the back they got a little rim that, that once you put the tire on you put the rim on and that holds the tire in there. But these two of those back rims glue a uh, piece of thin styrene in between those two uh, and cut it, cut the holes, drill the the holes for the uh, bolt, stud bolts. That became my wheel. This is the the pattern wheel. Uh, it's it, it's it's set in a clay base here that seals off the bottom. You pour the, pour the top half, uh, you let that set, turn it over, take the clay out, and then you pour the other half. And then you use mold release on, on those two silicones because they'll stick together. But then you pull that apart and you've got a two-piece mold for the wheel and that's up there too you can look at. For the front tire, I looked at all the Revell model, M18 scale model kits and most None of the tires were anywhere near the right diameter, so I found a tire that had the right cross section. I just cut a section out of it, got it to the right diameter, super glued that back together, and then I, I made a reverse mold. I used the rigid urethane to make the two halves of the mold and cast the tire itself in the rubber, urethane rubber. Here's how I made the rear wheels. I used the, I used the steel rim from a big T cut out the steely center of it, so I had just had the rim. Then I 
cast the center of a uh, big T mag, and this is the bad silicone rubber, this stuff falls apart instantly. But I, I cast the center of that big T mag, I sanded down the, the spokes flat to make it like a radar wheel, and then glued on little strips of styrene to make the, the ribs. So that's how I made the radar wheels out of a, an American mag. Rear tires uh, the, in the Ravel parts packs are a scale uh, eight inches wide, they're an inch wide. They need to be a scale 10 inches wide. So I just cut the tread, uh, shoved in some clear plastic, or just plastic tubing, and filled it full of uh, hardware store uh, black urethane, sanded that down, and then I got my white tires. They had the ugly printing on the white walls here, so I carved that off and re repainted the white walls. I was gonna, I was thinking about making a plastic, uh, using a, a big T axle, and uh, building up the plastic, making, taking a rubber mold of that, or plaster mold, and then casting a metal axle, but I said, I'll fabricate the axle, so I cut the axle out of 3 16 steel, or brass, uh, on the bandsaw, made up the spindles using these three pieces and this little space in there is to get the, the camber right. Uh, silver soldered them together and then just filed them to shape. And I'm really lucky to find some 5 8 inch springs, so they, they're scale 5 inch diameter springs, which is what Ed used, and half inch uh, copper caps for uh, plumbing uh, fit these springs perfectly. Just had to shorten the cap down a little, it was a little too tall. Cut these springs in half and they were exactly the right length, so that was pretty easy. Then it's just a matter of soldering that all together and a lot of filing and sanding. The, the pin just drops in here and the gravity holds in there. The rear axle I liked, I mentioned I used the uh, Lindbergh rear axle. Well, I used it because I like it better than the Ravel axle. The Ravel axle is split horizontally. So you have a seam there horizontally, so you have to kind of hide. The Lindbergh axle is split radially, so these parts all glue together where, you, where they should go together. To make the axles, I made a couple short stubs of brass here, uh, soldered on a square tubing uh, to bolt these things to, glued that into both ends, and then this, act, this semi-axle goes all the way through that, that stiffens up the whole thing, so nothing will break. And finally, you put the vacuum plate on, and the uh, brake plate up, uh, brakes the drum on, and then this threaded rod goes clear through, and nuts on each end hold it all together. Found these tiny, tiny screws that are just perfect for bolting the rear spring cups on. Talking about the real mystery on, uh, the frame kept breaking on it. It, they showed it for three or four years. Ed sold it to, uh, um, what's his name? Bob Larrabee. Bob Larrabee. And Bob Larrabee, in turn, sold it to the guy in Missouri that made the uh, Blue Deal Express. And uh, anyway, it just kept falling apart. And the guy said, called Ed, do you want this thing back? And he, he said, no. And uh, I have a picture that shows that they sent back the front and rear axles and then some kid in Missouri bought the car, uh, had all the engines and interior and everything on it, just no front and rear axle. His folks told him to get it out of the basement, so they chopped it up through threw it away. Oh. But anyway, uh, on the big car, that, that rear spring cup holder is just a 3 8 inch piece of steel, and it's pretty, pretty flimsy. There's a and hard bar that goes from the passenger side spring cup over to the driver's side frame. So as this, the thing bounces, the spring cup's trying to trying to do this. Well, they when Stalls bought the car, they hauled it from Los Angeles to Michigan. When they got it there, this thing was broken right here. It was cracked. And I, I had I'd welded uh, fillets in here on both top and bottom trying to avoid that. But right below the fillet is where it cracked. So what their fix was, they, they just welded a, uh, they just welded a little bar on the inside of this thing. It doesn't look bad at all. And trying to straighten that up. So that was a flaw that had built into the car. 
you know, this shows that's where the crack was. Here's my fillets, and right over the crack, there's a fillet here. So they just welded a little plate all the way down here. This is show my model is very authentic. It broke too about a, about a month ago. <laughs> Went to pick it up, and uh, one of the plates had, had broken off, and my solder job down here didn't work. So I just drilled a little hole and uh, epoxied a, a bar in there, a threaded rod in there, and then it bolted back on. So I think it's okay. So I think this is how I made the 20 uh, tie rod ends I needed. Uh, just uh, some 256 brass bolts. I uh, found some tubing that just slips over that, so that got soldered onto that. <clears throat> the threaded rod gets soldered here. And so you got a thread here and a thread here. And this is the, the finished tie rod end. Okay, making the rear wheels, I took that that cast center that I had, epoxied it into the steel, steel wheel from a uh, big rod, or a big T, and then drilled out the holes, uh, 172 bolts, so a good size lug for a, a one scale model, so if you do a lot of scratch building, you get these, you get your taps and lots of screws. Here's progress on the frame. I still don't have my body mounts on here. Here's the front motor mounts, the rear transmission mounts. This uh, rear thing here holds that hand hard bar from here to here. This bar here, uh, this lever is, is a pivot. This lever here has a, uh, in the big car, has a <coughs> hydraulic cylinder that raises and lowers. It raises and lowers these cups and raises and lowers the body. I didn't put that feature in this car. It, I just didn't want to fool with it. And uh, I, was, I was very creative here. I showed that the actual goes in backwards really nicely. Mm -hmm. But the point is, this, this is authentically what all the cross members had used in his frame. And you can see why the thing just would not hold together. Okay, now, to, now that I'm starting to work on the body, and I, I started all this stuff after I built the big car and I knew how to build, build the little car. So. And the other, the other motivation was Mark Gustafson. I made the mistake of sending him pictures back in 2001 of all my early stuff, and he just kept bugging me and bugging me and bugging me. When are you going to finish the car? So he kind of, I just didn't want to talk to him anymore, so I finished the car. <laughs> I, mount, I, mounted, I mounted the body, there's the body mounts so onto the frame. Uh, once it was mounted on the frame, I glued the plastic bubble in and the digit in, and I could finally cut the, uh, the rim out of the car. Uh, made up a hinge uh, for the back, uh, used 440 bolts on the body and the hinge on the, uh, the top, and this pin's removable so I can take it apart or just un unbolt these things, no big deal there. To make the body or the interior, now that I, my body was bolted to the, uh, I can bolt it to the frame, and my engines and transmissions are all in. Now I can start making the the interior. So I made the the floor plate. I just a thin layer of clay on top of the transmissions and and uh, bell housings, and then some thin aluminum, and then laid some. Uh, fiberglass cloth and hardware store resin on top of that, and that became my floor fan. fan. Once that's done, then I bolted the body back on and then laid modeling clay in there and got the shapes I needed and just uh, coated that with fiberglass, and there I had my interior. This make a real good Rorschach test. This is looking inside and this is looking outside. It's hard to tell what's going on here, but i sure that I did it. The seat is just a wood carving. For the pleats, I glued a uh, quarter round uh, styrene rod on the little strip of paper, and it needs 40 pleats because that's how many pleats were in the original, and that, that just glues right into the in depression I had in here. And then the, uh, the welting around here is just 1 32nd uh, styrene rod. Gear shift knob is uh, pretty easy to make. Uh, Copper, big copper rod. Turn these uh, buttons on the lathe. 
Ed used a steering wheel that had <coughs> the long slots in it and a hole. Uh, I couldn't find any of those on the eBay for the big car, so what I did was bought one with four holes in it. Otherwise, it's identical to, to the proper one. And then just use a slitting saw and cut out the, uh, the webs on three of these holes. I did the same thing on the uh, steering wheel that came from uh, the Lindbergh kit, so that, that was an easy fix. The TV is just made up of starring uh, pieces. Uh, then I took a picture of the TV screen of the 1963 El Monaco, which is what Ed used, and pasted the picture on there, and it came out really nice. Uh, typical scratch building way of making uh, rims on uh, uh, gauges. It's just little stubs of uh, tubing soldered in there to give the little, little the rim on a, on a gauge. Uh, these little little chunks of plastic rod fit up inside there and then I had picture, made pictures of the gauges and glued them on there. The radio is nothing but a strip of aluminum with some buttons screwed on it. Tail lights were probably the biggest challenge I had. They're, they're pretty complicated. Uh, they're 63 Chevy or 63 Ford Galaxy 500 tail lights and they've got that cross design in them. So I turned the lens in, in aluminum on the lathe and then made a casting of that with silicone and, and bondo. And then I filed four little lugs here that, that uh, sit in some bondo that I cast on top of the, the lens. This is how they all went together. And then I turned the bullets on a lathe and then these just got soldered together. So then I had that. All right, here's all the lights that I made. The headlight rim is just an aluminum turning. And the middle of the headlight was aluminum turning that I cast in clear resin, clear plastic uh, urethane resin. This is the uh, rim for the tail lights that I made from aluminum casting. Uh, tail lights were again uh, clear plastic that I just spray painted candy apple red. And then there's those stars I made. So they assemble them pretty, pretty authentic. This is the little headlight that goes over here on the passenger side. And then these are the two, uh, I guess call them running lights here on the headlight pod. And they're still on their screws. The headers I made using just, uh, I think, the ABS plates. And then these are are little uh, fittings that, you, that I got from a model supply store that specialized in uh, uh, industrial uh, factories and oil treating plants. And so their piping had, the, had these fittings that you just kind of plug together. So that's how I made my headers, just using these little parts here to glue them all together. Final trial assembly. Uh, all the major parts are here, the interior's in, the seat's in, all the chassis all together, so it's time to tear down and lots of sand. These are all the parts that uh, I had chrome plated, uh, vacuum chrome plated. Uh, those of you who do this see that I put this together wrong. I had too big, so I had to cut these in half. This just shows all of the parts that I had vacuum chrome plated on racks. Uh, the, the parts that were chrome plated from the factory I stripped, so everything was spare. <coughs> this is all the metal parts I had chrome plated, and I pre-polished all the parts, and so all the chrome plates had to dip, had just had to dip them. Chrome build was still pretty high, just like it was for the big car. Interior, I bought four or five, six different pieces of uh, fuzzy gray cloth until I find the one, found the one that I, I like the uh, scale fuzz on. And it went in there pretty easy. There's just a seam down the middle underneath the seat. Uh, but doing it that way, it's just wrapped around here, glued in, no problems. See the little TV over here, and the radio here, and the little bit of the dash gauge here, and then the steering wheel was just uh, sprayed with uh, glitter paint from the hobby store. Stereos have to be pinstripe, I'm sorry, but they have to do it. I, 
I did. I did. I bought this skin stripping tape back probably 30, 40 years ago, a long time ago, in anticipation of doing this project because my pin stripping skills are non-existent. And I'm glad I did because I don't think they make it anymore, but it, it came out really nice. I they do. I just got some about three weeks ago. They do? Something yeah, they good. make all the sizes. It's still available. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, for eight scale, this, this 164 is just perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, parts that were necessary for this that I really glad I had was my little welder. I should have gotten Nap gas instead of acetylene, it's a little too hot for brass. I can burn through the brass, but you know, it, it's great. The, uh, these little uh, uh, welding torches have their smallest tip is, is basically a pin. It's just really good. This guy here, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but it's precision scale modeling. This is where I got those uh, uh, 90 degrees and uh, turns for the headers. He makes all kinds of modeling parts. All the tiny screws you need, uh, all the tools you need, a lot of the parts you need. It, but it's a one-man operation. He sounds pretty old, and you call him up, and he'll take an order. My hand, you can hear him write it down. It comes, and it's just right, and sometimes it's not there. So I don't know how long he's going to be in business. So I'm kind of worried about it. But man, it, it's a good source. It's a nifty find. You guys probably know about it. With kind of modeling you guys do, but. Uh, uh, Orthodontic springs just make perfect uh, throttle return springs in eight scale. And it, they come in uh, closed loop and open loop, so make the springs any way you want them. Be warned, they're very tough, or hard to cut, and, and bending a, a loop on the end, it's almost impossible there. They have great memory, but they make, make great looking springs, you can see them here. Nice you know, springs. I the original mystery had uh, silver conductor, clear plastic uh, sheet uh, wires. I couldn't find any good sorts that I liked for that, so I just used a white hookup wire. But if I ever find some good uh, silver and clear wire, I'm going to change those out. Uh, you guys know about these things, but it was a re revelation to me. These things work. Uh, these liquid uh, chrome pans, and you get those at the uh, art stores. Okay, the 125th, that's the 1A scale. That very well covers what I did there. The 125th scale, I got some recommendations for you guys who are now kept up about Mysterion's want to go build one. You have to make some, some corrections. As good as the, as the Revell kit was, they made some pretty strange errors. They, they didn't need to be made, but they had made. First one is the nose pod has quite a few errors. Uh, if, you, if you look at the factory one, I, I built up one here. This is just a box build, and then this is one with all the changes that I recommend making on them. But you can see the, the standard for this uh, Cyclops light is just a, about an eighth, eighth inch tiny rod. It's, it's not not even close to what uh, they actually did. So what I did is I just drilled some holes in the in the pod and in the in the uh, uh, shroud. Real, uh, glued some some <coughs> glued some little rods in there, and then I could file that to shape. Another couple of problems I had was they have a real strange big dip right here, and just just ha just looking at them at the real material, you wouldn't put that dip in there, but they did. And these are so you fill that in. These are a little too big, so you need to fill those in. This needs to be a little rounded. The thing that really helps the look on this thing is the nose pod is just too long. That nose pod on the on the kit build just always looks way out of proportion. All you have to do is just sand that in half and, and things start looking really good. The headers, the exhaust tips are way too long. Uh, it just used quarter turn, uh, short radius quarter turns, so that needs to be fixed and they need to aim straight out, not down. Interior needs a lot of work. 
they, they put in some really strange squared off corners in here. It needs to be snug right to the seat. So a lot of Mondo goes in there. And the TV just has its face hanging out. No part of the TV shows or the radio. So here's, here's the factory uh, interior. You can see it, it's just have these really strange shapes to them. The TV's half hanging out. You need to round this off a little bit, round this off a little bit, slide the seat clear back, and then fill in the uh, shapes here, and then embed the TV and the radio. Their gear shift knob uh, in the kit looks like a uh, tapper handle for a Coors beer. It's a triangular shaped thing. I don't know why they did that. So just a chunk of clear plastic screw and a pin can fix that problem. Okay, this looks complicated, but it's not. I got a, I got a good side picture of the real Mysterion, on it, and I got a good side picture of a model. And, and all these lines here are just to scale the thing, so I, I made this exactly the same size as this. The holes here match the holes here. <coughs> so this matches this, the circles on the tires, all that stuff is noise, just, just to make sure that the sizes were exactly, the pictures were exactly the same. The thing that counts are the blue lines. I drew uh, blue lines on, around all the major uh, body features on the big car. And then in this purple, solid purple line, I did the same thing for, for the model. Then I took this blue line here and transferred it down here. And you can see the, the blue line shows that the, the tail was a lot taller and the, mm -hmm. the dash is a lot shorter. And I found a, a pivot point right here, so I cut the body right here. I cut this little wedge out of the top here, so this got down like here. And I had a gap here that I filled in with plastic. And that way I have the high rear end and the low front end like it should have. This is just what the inside of the body looks like. Uh, also, you need to hold the tire up there and radius this. This is too flat in the, in the tip box. I glue some parts on here to make these scoops a little bigger. They're a little too small in the model. The thing that bugs me about the, the model kit and uh, Johnny Lightning and Hot Wheels took their model, for their <coughs> design for their little uh, eye cast from the model kit is this thing, this shape right here is too flat. This needs to be a 90 degree angle right here. So what I did was I cut this off right here to here, cut that off. And here's, the, here's the distance between the, this little bubble and the surround. Uh, I uh, filed it off and polished it. Then I glued a piece of styrene in here. And this is the, how the distance should be. So that gets that shape right. That's always bugging me about that model. Uh, and the, the, the digit on the back is a little too skinny on the model, so I glued this little piece right on here and filed it a little fatter. Um, on the original, on the original Mysterion, Ed had these holes drilled right here, and he mounted <coughs> his rear uh, four links in between, in between, right under a hole instead of in between the holes. I think he drilled this hole and ordered these two short, so he just drilled another hole and put that in there. So if you want to be absolutely correct, you need to shorten these by a little less than an eighth of an inch, drill a new hole, and leave that hole there for the rear uh, four links. The front hubs are a little too bulky on the model. You need to sand these a lot thinner, the main flange, and sand these down as, as small a damage as you can get. So it's more like this. Rear tires that come in the kit are bulgy sided uh, modern slicks. That's not right. They need to be flat sided. So I used the old AMT 60s uh, positive traction slicks. And they are scaled uh, 8 inches, need to be 10 inches. So I sliced part of one off and glued it onto the other one to get them 10 inches wide. Had to carve out the center a little bit because the wheel doesn't quite fit. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this tool, but it's pretty neat for making uh, stick on the sidewalls. It's a little compass with a uh, 
exacto blade on it. Flip it around a couple times, you got really good white side ones. You don't have to try to paint them. Here's just some pictures of the, of the modified kit and the stock built. And you can see they have to have the instrument. You just have to. The shape here looks a lot better. The holes here look a lot better. This, this looks way out of proportion. When you sand it off, it looks a lot nicer. Side views. Again, you have, you have a lot prettier profile here than this flat one here. <coughs> Interiors. Uh, finished one, I used, I used some eBay flocking here. This is flocking that came with the original 1964 kit. It's a little too coarse, so I used a finer flocking here. Here's where the uh, in the original mystery on that's where the radiator cap is a radiator right here. And then the gear shift knob looks a lot better, steering wheel looks a lot better. Okay, I added I'm not really happy with what I've done on I'll probably try to redo this. I added the throttle linkage, which needs to be on there. You look at the kit mystery on it, it just looks bare. It has to have that throttle linkage. And there's the there's what Ed did, he had a, a rod that went across here, you pull on this, it actually, these rods here that actually this carburetor, this rod comes up here and actually these carburetors. Pretty complicated system, but on the real car it goes like this, it really works. And then I put, I put the gasoline lines on it, and so it's... Another problem with the kit is they give you chrome pans and chrome mufflers, and the real mystery on nothing was chrome underneath here, so. That That's it. Any questions? Uh, you can come up here and, and handle all these uh, pattern parts. They're all tough. Yeah. One of your first pictures, you had a center line. And it was offset in the front. It was offset. Yeah, the the wheels were actually offset. Is that in the models also? No. I do sport. a replica model. You got an offset in a hair. I, I didn't. I didn't put any of that offset in my car or the model. I see. Thank you. Yeah. I. I I'm just showing that Ed was a free form artist. He, he just was a free form artist. And what did he ever? Yeah. I, Thank I'm, you. I'm constrained by a tape measure. <laughs> I'm an engineer. What can I do? There's no more questions. Thank you. Uh, the fuel lines, where do they go? I understand the real car didn't have a fuel tank. Or is that not right? Um, there's, I have a picture of Ed at a show where he's got a gas can, he's got the carburetor off, uh, air cleaner off one carburetor, and it looks like he's trying to start it. Hmm. And Oscar Kowalski, uh, I called him and talked to him. He, he went out, and there's a little Auto World uh, pamphlet where he talks about and shows the pictures of Ed when he was building the Mysterion. Talks about going out and visiting Ed and hearing it run. I called him, he said, yeah, I think they ran. So I think they did run. I, my gas tank is just a little, like one gallon tank. It goes right here. There's no room for anything here. The battery, the battery's over here. I mean, it, there's no room for anything. The TVs don't fit. It, I used exactly the same TV Ed did, and I had to I had to just use the face because the TV stuck halfway out of the body. There's no way he used the TV, so there's no room on this for anything. There was a picture, and here's your hobby hot rodding that had the, the gas tank and said it was fur lined as well. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah. No, he. It, I think there was. I think he ran it okay. at least one time. But then he had to take all the guts out of the engine. All well, we got side of the transmission is trying to lighten it up so the frame wouldn't break, and that still didn't work. Is that when the frame broke when he was in the Um, it, it's just driving it around in the in, a, in the in the trailer. That that was just driving it from California, my car to California to uh, Michigan broke the frame. And he said just driving around in the in the truck destroyed the car. Can you tell us about the yellow paint? Okay, the yellow paint for the body. Most people are going to spray their model testers yellow or 
Uh, they had uh, Ed Roth colors, Ed Roth yellow. It's basically lemon yellow. It's not the right color. The paint job, I did a lot of investigations on this, is a white base uh, and a pearl coat, and then it's called uh, lime green uh, candy. I found a house of color still made this stuff. And so it's actually a candy, candy apple paint job. And this stuff, this lime green paint, is, it looks lemon yellow here, but if you spray it over silver, it's got a green tint. You spray it over white, <coughs> it's yellow. When I sprayed it, when I sprayed my car, I took a picture of it and uh, in the booth after I finished painting it, and then I went back to my pictures, and that's lime green. So it's a weird color, but no, it's a candy apple yellow. Yeah, you, is there some place we can view or buy that information you have in your... I think they're going to publish it. Yeah. yeah this whole slide show will be up there, and then you can give a call anytime. Good. Okay. Over here. Yeah. That blue 164 tape, is that drafting tape? Is that what you Yeah, mean? it's track back. back. It's yeah, it's available online. Drafting tape. Well, it's chart pack. Chart pack's the name of it. You used they, to they use it for mapping when you didn't have computers. They did use it, right? Yeah. You know, I first hired on the oil business in 72, or Rassman made their maps that way until the computers mm -hmm. came out. So. so I'm glad they still like this stuff. Yeah. What I'm going to do for the, for the models, for the Ravel models, I'm going to try making uh, some decal sheets. Got a guy that does really good decal printing, and I'm just going to draw a bunch of lines, some blue, and some quarter circles, and some of the fancy shapes, and uh, have decals, and spend the rest of my life and ruining my eyes trying to put those decals on. <laughs> it has to have that. It has to have beauty strip. Question? Yeah. What was the name again of the person that made contact with the Peterson Automotive Museum? Um, Tony Simone. S-I-N O-N-E. And you can look up, uh, I, I can give you his contact information. Oh yeah, okay. And I talked to him quite a bit because I'm interested in getting my fish body cars somewhere, not with the great grandkids as four toys. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, I got some, uh, books up here uh, on building the big car. That's why I didn't talk about building the big car because it's all in a book. Excruciating detail. So if anybody wants to buy one of those, they're up here. And let's see. That's about it. Thank you.